Hey everyone, welcome to the podcast. I'm Harlan Cohen, and I'm so excited to share my conversation with Ron Lieber. If you don't know Ron, on his website, his titles are Husband, Dad, New York Times, Money Columnist. And that's really how he makes me feel. Not like he's my husband or dad, but he's like just this very kind, warm soul. And you can tell he wants you to have this information so you can make the best decisions. And uh, we've had conversations in passing, but never a longer form conversation. And it was really great to talk to him. So many takeaways. Um, I want you to know about his book, The Price You Pay for College, an entirely new roadmap for the biggest financial decision your family will ever make. In this book, he also talks about Merit Aid. And we touched on Merit Aid a little bit. We're going to do a deeper dive when we have another conversation. Uh, for the one you're going to listen to, I thought his insight on early admissions was really fascinating. We talked about the whole financial aid mess. And we talked about the value of school. Is a highly selective school really worth it? And when is it worth it? And I really appreciated his take. And uh, he just has so much information and uh, just a good person. And I hope you enjoy my conversation with Ron Lieber. Ron, I'm so excited to be here with you. Thanks for taking the time. It's a pleasure. I'm glad we're able to do this. Yeah, you know a lot. You know a lot about college. You know a lot about money. You know a lot about parenting. My understanding is you have a senior this year. Is that right? I do. Yeah. So the two of us, we're both going through this. <laughs> I have a senior. I, I just went to a uh, admitted student day uh, event and um, it was pretty cool. It was wild. Wow. Yeah. It was so weird to be the dad because uh, we're too young. Right. Well, I mean, it's also weird to be the parent, but also to be, uh, you know, an expert or a quasi expert. Um, I spend a little bit less of the pie chart of my time working on college stuff than you do, I think. Uh, yeah. And both of us, you know, know more than 99.6% of the parent population about how all this stuff works and sort of the challenge of when to open your mouth and when to keep it shut is a never ending challenge with our teenagers. Yeah, I, I know you do. You do lots of different. You do lots of different work, and uh, I, I love that you're a dad. Like I, I really feel like you're a dad. Like you're like a warm man. <laughs> it's, I mean, I don't know how many conversations have started off with people calling you a warm man, Ron. But, but, but I'll you take got, it. I'll take it. You know, well, I saw you when you were at Parker doing an event. You and Jeff Salingo, and I had the chance to to grab your book, The Price You Pay for College. And uh, it's a great book, and it was it was just nice to hear your story. And I think it's interesting because you went to you went to a private school in Chicago, and you know Parker's like a you know Parker's kind of a you know it's a fancier fa I hate to use the word fancy, but it's you know in, in Chicago there are like you know a couple really you know big independent schools, and you got the Latin school, and, and then and then Parker Francis Parker. So you you went to Parker. But then what's so interesting is when your family was was when you were in Parker, your family went through some some difficult times. And, and you know, can you speak to that? Because I think that your life and your journey, it looks like you don't know what it's like to face adversity, or at least if someone's going to make a snap judgment. But I, I, I find that really interesting. Yeah, it, it's it's sort of a, a, a mixed up scenario. You know, things went just bad enough for me to gain some well-earned perspective, even while I was sort of sailing through on a tidal wave of privilege. Basically what happened was uh, I was at Francis Barker in Chicago private school for you know about eight years. I have a brother and sister who are twins. They were five years behind me. Um, and things were going reasonably well for my family. Um, you know, on a it, the 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 tuition back then, you know, was less as a percentage of you know household income as I think it is today. Um, it was a stretch for my parents, but they were able to do it. Um, we definitely did not have as much money as a lot of other people in the community, but we had more than enough, more than enough such that we were able to go. And then my parents split up. One household turned into two. My dad promptly lost his job and it was a couple of years until he earned much income to speak of. And, you know, it was probably a dozen years until he, he, had, he was anywhere close professionally back to where he was before. And so those years overlapped with middle school, high school, and college, right? So right away, we were kind of at the mercy of the school. They had every right to evict all of the Lieber kids for lack of ability to pay. 
but we had built up a lot of goodwill, right? We were good kids. You know, both of my parents were contributing members of the community yeah. and they effectively passed the hat at the board level uh, in order to make sure that we were able to stay. And it wasn't just one year. It was the rest of the time that I was there. So, um, you know, it, just in high school, uh, you know, I, I learned a little bit about what it was like to have that sort of financial earthquake happen. And then after that, I had to find a way to get to and through college. Right. And that was that was interesting, just watching you there and 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 seeing you know, how much the community appreciates you and just knowing that they supported you. Because I, I didn't know that. And I think that there's also so much we don't know about people. You know, like that's the other thing. I mean, I, I don't like to make assumptions and people love making assumptions. But but the assumptions is you the assumption of being. New York Times financial columnist, uh, author of, of several books, really well spoken, and um, having attended a, a private school, the the challenges of just working through working through all of that. So, I sent you a note about FAFSA, okay? Because let's just go to present day. Because I have a lot of parents and a lot of students who listen to this podcast because they want actionable information, and I want them to leave with that as well. So. I have a parent who who wrote me this message and I asked if I can share it with their permission and they said I can. And um it's a little bit it's it's a little bit long but I think it's really important because it really spells out what's happening and this is real time. This was yeah, you know, I got this this morning. You know, like cuz I get I get I get people write to me a lot. And this is why I'm really grateful to to have this relationship with you Ron because I think there's a lot that needs to be done to share information. And also to, I, I look at myself as an advocate for, for the students and families. So, all right, that's the setup. So this person said, we finally have a decision in our house, which is such a relief on many levels. And for those listening, it's April 30th. Decision day is May 1st. And for a large number of families, they have not received financial aid letters. So they don't know what they're paying, right, Ron? Exactly, right? Um, you know, for people who are, are only just coming to this news or, or haven't been quite sure what it means, uh, you know, so the short story is, is that they completely changed the way that people file for fe federal financial aid this year. The change has gone really poorly, and that's caused a ton of problem at colleges because most of the colleges out there just use this federal form that the government changed and screwed up. And it's still screwed up. So there's still millions of people who don't know exactly what they're going to pay. And without knowing what you're going to pay, you can't know where you're going to go. So it's a huge problem. Yeah. And and the letter will will share a lot of the problems that we can we can do a little deeper dive into. So we finally have our decision. A little background. My daughter was torn between two schools. And while we, her parents, really wanted her to go to Purdue for engineering, frozen tuition, countless convos about affordability, women in engineering department. She ultimately chose Michigan, University of Michigan, mostly because in her words, she wanted more than just engineering from the school. She hopes to also study German and felt U of M was a better fit for other reasons too. This situation with FAFSA is such a damaging mess and will have lasting consequences for so many students. It makes me really, really upset and it's hard to know what to do in terms of action items to help feel like there'll be a solution eventually to trust the system, to trust the calculations and not wonder if or how the Department of Ed and Universities will make this right and wherein lies the accountability. This is like a, hu a huge issue. And the reason I, I wrote to you, there's more to the letter, but just to, to kind of pause, the lack of accountability when it comes to what's been happening to families right now uh, schools requiring deposits, non-refundable deposits, without disclosing what the costs of school will be, uh, requiring housing deposits, uh, students having to get in line to get the best housing, to get the best classes, because when you go through orientation tends to be when you get to select classes. So with all of these things happening, and, and the rest of the letter will, will spell a lot of this out, in terms of accountability, who are schools accountable to? Yeah, so um, uh, it is not a rhetorical question. And um, look, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the sort of, you know, technical, legal uh, answer. Um, and, and then I'll give you the one that I wish was true, but is not yet, but will be someday if I do my job better and you come along with me. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so so here are the here are the you know sort of current modern day um answers to the questions um schools uh answer to their accreditors right so every school is is accredited there are a number of accrediting bodies and as general rule it's kind of a rubber stamp right you know the creditors show up you pay a bunch of money um, you know, they give you some feedback, but it's pretty rare that uh, or, uh, I can't even recall the last time that it's happened where an accreditor showed up and said, no, you should be shut down. Right. This this right. the school is not accountable, uh, you know, in any number of ways. Right. So. Um, uh, so it's accountable to creditors. Um, it is accountable to the federal government in in some important ways. Right. You can't, uh, you know, abuse the financial aid system. Um, you can't lie on behalf of your students. Um, uh, there are all sorts of Title IX and other civil rights and, you know, related requirements um, to make sure the students have access uh, and that, that they are safe. Um, so, you know, those are the sort of quasi-regulatory and um, governmental um, requirements. Certainly you have to, you know, comply with, you know, land use laws and stuff like that. Right. But it's not what this person who wrote you is driving at. Um, what this person who wrote you is driving at is, isn't there anything we can do uh, to, as a collective body of consumers, uh, of shoppers, to make this all better. And, uh, you know, the colleges will resent that framing this year in particular, because I think part of what drove, um, you know, the anger in, in that message from the person who wrote to you, you know, is feeling like the schools had fallen down on the job. But as far as the schools are concerned, they're victims of the Department of Education not doing its job. And the Department of Education feels like it's a victim of um, Congress, Republicans in Congress in particular, who didn't give them enough money to get the job done correctly. So, you know, everybody's passing the blame. That's how the world works. Um, you know, blame is always passed. Uh, and we shouldn't really expect higher education to be any different. And yet we're constantly disappointed by higher education because we expect the standards to be higher, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, so how does this change, right? How um, do these institutions get held to account? The only way I can think of for it to happen quickly right. is for an army of consumers to right. Band together and rise up and think of themselves as consumers, right? And demand change, right? So right. you know, I don't want to get all like violent or militaristic about right. this. The fact of the matter is, is that um, all too many of us parents um, treat ourselves as supplicants in this process, not applicants, right? Right. We, you know, we're sort of going hat in hand with our children, right. you know, l looking to be granted admission or at right. least, you know, the, the, the hundreds, the couple right. hundred schools that, you know, reject the highest proportion of, of applicants in the U.S. Right. Um, and there's not a lot of people showing up uh, on tours or group information sessions and demanding to be treated better right demanding better information and more transparency and so you know i'll just give you one tiny example too actually of the ways in which i've tried to move the needle on behalf of consumers but also urged people to kind of come along with me to ask tougher questions or take a stand so the first one is early decision right so a right. couple hundred schools out there use early decision to try to rope in sometimes as many as, as you know, 60 percent of, right. of their first year class um, and get the applications in November and give out um, acceptances uh, in December. Um, and the schools very much want you to believe that early decision is binding. If you get in, you have to go. 
this isn't true. Early decision is not binding. If the school does not make you an affordable offer, if the price quote is not something that you feel like you can pay, then you can turn and walk away and you should. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wrote this story, you know, we'll put it in the show notes, uh, in the times a couple of years ago with the headline, early decision is not binding. Let us explain. And I got even Northeastern university, which is, you know, many listeners know is a pretty sharp elbowed, you know, institution, a pretty savvy operator in the marketplace. Even Northeastern came onto the record and said, of course, early decision is not binding if you can't afford to pay, right? So, um, you know, we don't have to play that game, right? They're trying to hoover up a bunch of higher income people, uh, you know, in the first round to kind of smooth out their revenue projections. And that's great. They should act in their best interest. Our best interest is not saying yes to a school that doesn't provide a price quote up front and then demands that we uh, you know, show up no matter what sort of price quote they offer after they give out the the letter of admission. So by that same token, right, um, there's nothing wrong with going to a school ahead of time and saying, I want to know what I'm going to pay uh, if, you know, my kid applies and gets in. I don't trust your net price calculator, which is the tool that every school has to have where you input your data. Um, I'd like you to check to make sure that I put the data in right uh, and that your calculator interpreted it correctly. And because yours is a school that offers um, a lot of merit aid, right? Not just need-based aid, but merit aid discounts. Uh, I'd like an assessment ahead of time of you know what kind of merit aid my kid might be offered because you know, the difference between 15,000 off and 26,000 off is a difference that makes a difference. That's 44 grand after taxes over four years. It's a, that's a big deal, right? So tell me ahead of time, right? right? If enough people show up and demand better information, eventually the schools will just have to start offering it, right? If people turn right. and lock and don't apply um, without the data they need. Um, so, you know, this feels sort of slow and frustrating going to me, um, but it's not like the accreditors or the federal government uh, are going to do much uh, to help. I mean, good luck getting Congress to act on some of the right. initiatives they've tried to put in place here. So that's a really long answer to her question. But, you know, the answer is to look in the mirror and demand better, to have the courage uh, to ask um for a better deal. And I guess another way to think about this, right, is that as disappointed as we may be as, you know, college shoppers or you and me as kind of professionals or quasi-professionals in the yeah. space, as disappointed as we may be in institutions, right, in, in the educational bodies, there are all sorts of individuals within even the most sharp-elbowed problematic institution, all sorts of individuals who desperately want to be of help, who are kind, who are knowledgeable, um, and and who uh, want nothing more than to be of use. So use them, right? Find them. Go into the financial aid office when your kid is a junior in high school. Seek someone out. Make them your pen pal, right? If things are confusing, ask questions, right? In a in a polite tone of voice so that you right. don't embarrass your child. Um right. individuals um can 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 be of you know incredible assistance here. Um certainly the you know, the whole group of uh, college counselors sort of toiling away in high schools, often with limited resources and too many students, um, you know, use their knowledge, right? Make them your friend. Yeah. It's really important to advocate, to make your voice heard and to to trust that you'll be okay. You know, there's this this part of options give us power. You know, when we don't feel like we have options and we live in a world of scarcity, we tend to be much more complacent and, and as you're me- me- mentioning, um, supplicants, uh, it's a good word. I've never used the word supplicant. It's a great, it's as opposed to applicant, it really rings and it's, it's, it's so appropriate because it's, it's entering a situation from a place of lack versus abundance, uh, from this place of knowing I'm going to be okay no matter what, but the game is scarcity. The game is fear. The game is that if you don't get into a certain place, 
and pursue a certain path, then your life is not going to be uh, as wonderful as you hope it will be, which this is the um, th- this is the other part of, of our conversation that I really wanted to to get into. And I'm, I'm contemplating if I want to get into it now or finish the letter. I'm going to finish the letter, but, but but let's circle back to how can we know that we live in a world of options and that we're going to be okay no matter what? And I've listened to some of your other interviews and, and you know, read the book and you've got wonderful thoughts on this. And I want to kind of tease some of those out. So remind me, Ron, let's, we, we will, we will put a little, a little bookmark right here in that conversation. I'm going to go back to this letter and then we'll, and then we'll continue with that. So, so is that cool deal? Sounds great. Okay, great. So you'll keep me, you'll keep me uh, on track too. Cause I really, I, I need, I need help sometimes. So uh, I, I appreciate that. And I, one thing about me is I'm not afraid to say where I need help. Like, that's the thing. This has been the best part of doing what I've been doing lately is, uh, it's like, I could be so imperfect and be so helpful. And it's like the bar is so low because I'm just doing my best and uh, we're all of this together. All right. So the parent continues. We found out last week from Purdue in Iowa that our FAFSA application was returned to the Department of Education for reprocessing after being processed and seemingly good. The Department of Ed sent a letter this week saying they need information from the IRS and are working with them directly to get it. After probably eight to 10 hours on the phone with them in January, working through my daughter's data, getting stuck in a glitch, everything looked good until we were notified by a few schools that it was sent back. So they, in January, did everything they could and they're being notified. Like I get chills. It's so infuriating a week before, you know, college decision day that the schools needed more information and there's nothing we can do nor the schools to help this along. Purdue informed us they would have the reprocessed FAFSA by the end of May. End of May. We have no official financial aid offers from any school. And when we heard the new timeline, we threw up our hands and said, F it. Very unlike us. And I'm sharing this because I'm sure we aren't the only ones going through this. And it is so maddening for us personally and for all the students, incoming and current, who are dealing with the stress, unknowns, and unanswered questions that could derail their future plans and financial situations. Finally, my question. Do you have thoughts on who to contact and how we may voice our deep concerns about this process that has gone sideways? and is harming students and families. And I know we touched on that, but I wanted to just add one more piece. This is from someone who is educated, who I think is probably not a first-generation family from everything I can pick up. And then you have all these students, because I do a lot with first-gen students, I do a lot with low-income families, who have no idea what they're doing. Uh, The schools are saying, we're not going to switch, we're not going to change our deadline. Uh, we 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 aren't going to be able to to work with you on this. Uh, it's it's just it's uh it's catastrophic for especially students who don't have the means or the resources or the knowledge. Yeah. And so the thing that's mis- mysterious about this particular case, and I, you presumably are not in a position to answer questions about it, is. Why was this a problem at Iowa and Purdue, but it wasn't a problem at Michigan? Oh, you know what? I, I took a, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't finish the letter. I copy and pasted most of it. So, so there's, 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 there's more to it. But um, what I find is when there was a glitch that I was going through, uh, there would be all these people who were dealing with the same glitch. Like on the portal, it said everything was in, or my son put his signature in. But then I looked and it said, it was processed, but it was processed without a signature. And there's all these people who then said, I'm having the same issue. So it looks like on the portal, everything is good or someone does everything they think they need to do. And I've been urging people, check, check, check. So, um, okay, there's more. Okay. So it went against every fiber of my being to allow my daughter to sign on to going to a university without a finalized financial aid offer. Okay. This is the answer. Thank you for asking that, Ron. I'm churning inside because we allowed this. Yet Michigan didn't willingly extend its May 1st deadline. And there is the May 6th housing deadline. All the potential requests for extensions became overwhelming. And she did not want to jeopardize her spot. So we let her commit with the understanding that these circumstances are exceptional. 
circumstances are exceptional. We're talking tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, essentially. And this leads me to my next question. Looking to next year, which we hope will be a smoother process with financial aid, do you have any tips or timelines for scholarships for sophomores through seniors? We missed many scholarships within the schools she applied to because our timing was off. They didn't even know they were going, so they couldn't even apply. We weren't aware that they were offered until she applied. And in some cases with regular decision applicants, we had blown through the deadlines. It's been very difficult to keep the emotions out of this decision process. At the end of the day, I think my daughter made the right decision and she will be paying part of her schooling, which means debt. I'm so grateful she can still go to college despite the financial aid obstacle. And at the same time, I'm staring at the inequity of the situation, watching privilege once again, help the students who have more than enough, including my child, and wondering what I can do to help chip away at this problem that seems so complex and insurmountable. Graduation's almost upon us, and although I feel winded this year, I hope to enjoy celebrations in the coming weeks. Congratulations to your son on graduation and commitment to a school. So that I think that really sums it up, Ron. Yeah, so I I mean, there, there are a couple of big questions embedded in there. I, it feels like one of the things this parent is searching for um, is the ability to kind of not so much lash out and or punish the responsible parties, um, but to understand uh, why it had to be so gruesome. Um, yeah. And, you know, I don't doubt that everybody was doing the best that they could. I, I do have real questions about universities that really would not um, extend the housing deadline. Um, for schools to create a situation where only the people for whom money um, was not a factor could get access to the best dorms or be first in the queue, that that's a real problem. Um, I've been looking for concrete evidence um, that that uh, has happened. And if anybody out there listening wants to send it to me, uh, I'm I'm all ears. Um, it you know the the writer seems to be suggesting the possibility that that might have happened here, um, or it was right. going to happen. It's it's hard to say. Um, right. Um, but you know, if, if you want to tee off on a school that your kid is not going to, nothing's stopping you from writing to the opinion editor of the college newspaper. And, you know, write, writing a note, uh, writing an op-ed column that sort of shames the institution in its own house organ, um, you know, if you're feeling like you want revenge. But I don't think that's primarily I, I, what, what this writer is getting at. Um, you know, this person seems to have a, a, a bigger and more sort of community-minded spirit. Um, and, you know, to answer their specific questions about next year, Gosh, I hope that this will be solved, uh, yeah. you know, by by October one, when everybody has to do this, uh, you know, again for their rising soft sophomores. Um, there are definitely people uh, in the financial aid community who are worried that it will not be fixed by October. So I, I don't know that I would count on it. And I think everybody should be filling out their their financial aid forms for next year on October first when the system opens up, um, so that. Yeah, the longest period of time to you know correct whatever potential problems it yeah. has, but you know this person makes more than one reference to the people who have less than average. I know Arlen, you were talking earlier about um, you know all sorts of first gen kids who just have no idea, and uh, you know if this letter writer wants to make a difference for them, you know the best thing they can do is donate to a nonprofit that exists um, to help. Uh, students who have less than average and whose families may be doing this for the first time and provides, you know, counselors to them to to help them not only get to college, but through college. And, you know, if you want, we can put yeah. some names of those organizations sure. in the show notes. You know, I think for the way I interpret this as it, it's, the, it's a lack of control in these situations where you have a large corporation, a large business. And I remember when you and Jeff Salingo were, were doing your program at, at Parker, it was really about the business of college. That this is a business, and uh, separating the emotion from the business. And in this particular situation, this person's so frustrated because the emotion really became intertwined in the in the business. And because of the potential implications, they just surrendered and said, "I'm going to do what's the best against my own best interest," because I I don't have I'm powerless in the situation. 
I think it's this it's this piece of you have these 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 schools that almost seem like they can bulldoze over whatever whatever problem they have and it, 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 it and there isn't a uh there there isn't a way other than to of course you know share it and publicize it um goodwill and ethics and business you know ethical business practices you know those are all things that that come into play like can you take a non-refundable deposit or require someone to give a non-refundable deposit when they don't know what the cost of that education is going to be um and then you were also saying the housing piece is one and i was really fixated on not just the housing piece but also the um once a student is is admitted then they go through the orientation process and the onboarding and the onboarding is i don't know with with your with your daughter if if she's committed and has started you know that process is that has that all yeah, it depends on the, the institution, but the larger the institution, the more likely it is that onboarding and orientation takes place in sort of clumps of students over months as opposed to everybody together, you know, right. over a week. Right. So it's, you know, I know with my son, the first one already filled up and, you know, he's getting in on and the early ones because the earlier you are in the orientation process in most or many schools, try not to use absolutes, in many situations the uh the course schedule fills up because it's this so the students who are going through orientation in august well it's it's kind of like they get the remainder of what's available mm -hmm. so when you look at the equity piece mm -hmm. and this translates to how does this impact our most vulnerable students well those most vulnerable students are getting kind of the the scraps of the schedule in some in some ways and they're not getting the most uh, desirable living arrangements. And they are dealing with, with, then there's the question of access to like TRIO programs and first generation programs and all those areas that, are, that provide the supports that really reinforce a student and, and, and keep them on track. Because it's, it's, it's just, there's so many effects, there's so many ripples. And, and it's like, Ron, you're so interesting. I could spend the whole hour talking about you and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely hopefully do this again if you're if you're willing but it's like right now this inflection point of april 30th may 1st is approaching um it's 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 such a story and i know there's so many other stories that are going on because columbia university is is being you know as we speak uh being invaded uh it try, you know, windows being broken and people it's like there's live a live feed right now so what's happening in terms of college admissions is, which is kind of the irony. People are so eager to get in when there's so much, there's so much craziness going on. Um, but uh, the what, one other piece, Miami of Ohio, um, I have some inside info there, and they sent this beautiful letter, which I, which I, I don't know if I shared with you, but I could share with you. Basically, the um, the thrust of the letter was that we know what's going on, and you have every right to ask for extensions. And here at Miami, if you can't decide by May 15th, let us know and we will extend the deadline for you. And if other schools don't, you have every right to ask them. And uh, it really called out the other schools in a way that I haven't seen, um, but I haven't read that many. But it was uh, it was interesting. What do you like? I know that it's all happening in real time, but do you have do you have any strong feelings about how things are operating and how schools are, are working through this, given their hands are tied in many ways? Yeah. So, I mean, here's where I'm at a little bit of an information disadvantage. Um, uh, you know, I, I at my day job, I write about everything under the sun that yeah. hits you, uh, you know, in the wallet. Um, and so, you know, this week in the New York Times, I'm writing about housing. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote about the tax implications of, you know, your leftover embryos if you're done with IVF and fertility treatments. And so I'm not watching this stuff full time. Um, right. If Miami of Ohio is calling out other schools that are not offering extensions, more power to them. Um, please send me that note. I'd love to, you know, blast it around on the socials because um, everybody should be giving extensions uh, at this point. Um, so, uh, uh, so I, but you know, I, I, I have plenty of sympathy for the school. Yeah. They did not ask to be put in this spot. 
Sure. Um, and for the smaller ones, um, particularly small ones in the Midwest, um, you know, that are ex experiencing, uh, you know, revenue challenges, um, uh, they don't want to go into the summer uh, having no earthly idea how many kids they're going to have the day after Labor Day, right? You can't really plan and you can't really budget if you don't know who's going to be coming and what they're going to be paying. And so, you know, they're as frustrated by the process uh, as you all are. Um, and they um, they also need to plan. They also need to budget. And so, you know, it's not surprising to me that it's certain schools that um, may have may reject more people than they accept you know, they may feel like they have the market power to just sort of draw a line and say, you've got to make a decision now because they know that even among the lower income people, a certain uh, probably high percentage of them will be willing to just throw up their hands and sign on the dotted line for, you know, the opportunity of yeah. you know, going to a highly rejective institution. And right. you know, when you have market power, it's tempting to use it. And some institutions will. And um, when they do, well, then you know who you're dealing with, right? Right, right. And, and you know, for all of these, I, have, I haven't confirmed with officials. I just have the letter from Miami. I have lots of correspondence from lots of different families. And, you know, I tell them to make sure you get everything in writing, make sure you have that. And when you get in writing, share it. Because if it's something where you're a high in demand school and you know you, you know you're going to fill your class to be a little flexible to be a little more flexible is something that, that they can do my understanding and someone told me that deadlines the admission deadlines are kind of like are kind of like the um ed like a school has an admissions deadline but if you say 2 weeks after or a month after that you still want to attend that school they're going to honor that that admission I, in in most instances, they will. Now, you know, all bats are off at the you know twenty five or fifty schools that reject the highest percentage of students. Um, but you don't get the thing that you don't ask for. And the fact of the matter is, is that um, for years now, after the supposed May first deadline, colleges will reach out to students they accepted who they have not heard from and say, "Hey, you know." Just in case money is is a factor here, how about another six grand off per year? So they're literally like dropping twenty five thousand dollars in cash, in effect, or in coupons, but you know, cash savings into the inboxes of teenagers trying to get them to change their mind after they've clearly already committed to another school and just haven't bothered telling you know some other institution that admitted them, right? So uh, you know they've been playing games after May first for years. Um, in a year like this, when families feel like games are being played upon them, upon families, of course it's fine to go to an institution and say, "Hey, you know, can we still can we still make a deal here?" And um, in most instances, they will have that conversation. And you know, we should also be honest about the fact that if you represent um, uh, a net tuition, net revenue to them that is above the average that they normally get, um, then they're going to be especially interested right. in talking to you in most right. cases. Right. So even if it's after the deadline, you you can still you can still try to get in. You know, I've heard that the schools are going to accept you, and and Ron re reiterates that. So I wanted to revisit that piece of how do we have options and power when it comes to pursuing our education. And in particular, when you have a student who is 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 you know, in a situation where they can't afford, even, and I know the sticker price is not what most students pay, what's the percentage, I know you have this data, of um, who pays what when it comes to the sticker prices versus what students actually pay? Yeah, it, it depends on public versus private, but um, suffice it to say that it it is a small percentage of students who are paying full price at private colleges. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, at, at 
the institutions that reject a much higher percentage of students. Um, that's, you, you know, there's a correlation between that and those institutions being particularly well endowed. Um, you know, at those institutions, it might be 40 or 50 or 60% full pay. Right. If you kind of go down the ladder of prestige in private institutions, um, you know, even at some really great uh, private schools, nearly everybody is getting a discount. I mean, for a couple of years now, Oberlin has just been handing out, you know, $10,000 coupons to everybody who gets in. Um, right. There are lots of, um, you know, families where the parents make a million dollars a year, um, you know, where the kids are still getting $25,000 a year in merit aid because they're operating in a marketplace. And, you know, that's what it takes these days to get a smart kid to come to your small liberal arts college uh, in Ohio in a place that's not even, you know, a city. Um, a lot of kids want to go to school in the city, right? I so, you know, they do what they have to do. And for people who want to do a deeper dive into into merit aid, Ron has a, lo a lot of information on this um, in your books, in your writing, in your course. You have a merit aid course that really does a deep dive and helps people to understand what is merit aid, how can you access, or at least how can you identify the best opportunities to get merit aid. So I highly encourage people to check that out. We'll include that as well uh, in, in our show notes. But the question is, if you have a student who's, let's say, uh, has the option of going to an Ivy League school and they're getting pretty much nothing. Uh, then they have the option of going to an honors program at a state school for a full ride, the, the big conundrum. Uh, what, is, what is the value? Is it worth $300,000 to pursue $400,000, right? I know that you just had an article. Another article Ron just posted was uh, how Vanderbilt is approaching the 100000 100, a year. It's wild, man. Can't believe that, right? Soon it's going to be two hundred. We'll have the two hundred thousand a year article. Um, God forbid. Um, anyway, so when you have that student who's uh, sorry to bring God into it, when you have a student who's got that option of uh, going to that highly selective, highly rejected school versus the state school honors program, uh, you know, I'd love to hear your answer. Yeah. So I, I mean, I always go back to this: like, what is the point of the exercise here? Like, what exactly is it that you are shopping for? Because, you know, the answer is it, it depends on what you're trying to get out of it, right? Now, um, I, you know, I'm going to make a series of like pointed statements and pointed questions here. These are not judgments. The only judgments I have are towards people who don't take a disciplined process to asking themselves inconvenient questions about the process, right? So what are you shopping for? Um Maybe you're shopping for the education, right? Um, your kid wants to have their brain rearranged and rebuilt, uh, you know, into a much bigger and better version of itself, perhaps such that uh, they can go on to graduate school and, you know, become a professor or something else that requires a PhD, right? So you go for the learning, number one. Number two, you go for the kinship, right? To find the people who are your people, maybe you come from a place where nobody was really like you, or even worse, nobody really cared for you, right, or discriminated against you. You're going somewhere to find your people, the people who will lift you up and carry you through life. And that's not just friends, although peers are incredibly important. It might be the mentors. Maybe it's a professor. Maybe it's a dean. Um, maybe it's a member of the campus clergy. Uh, you know, maybe it's your financial aid director. My financial aid director and I are still buddies, uh, you know, 35 years later, right? So you're looking for the people who are going to kind of drag you into being a better version of the person you already are and are going to keep helping you along the way, you know, for half a century afterwards. Right. So that's number two. Right. We've talked about learning. We've talked about kinship. Um, number three, some people go to school just because they want to have a damn good time. Right. They are paying for the party. They are paying for the quality of the lived experience. Um, they're paying for the football games and the fraternities and all of the fun uh, that happens during um, these four years or more, sometimes five. Right. So again, no shame, no blame, no judgments, but be honest with yourself if that's, you know, what you're shopping for. And then finally, and, and this one's the hardest one, um, you know, you're, you're, um, you're shopping against a background of 
um, snobbery and elitism. Right. So you have to start with your own snobbery and your own elitism. Right. As a parent, like what will people think? Right. If my kid goes here instead of there, or, you know, what's the window going to be on my car if I have one or like the Instagram, you know, sweatshirt reveal or all the rest of it. Right. It's hard to escape from this notion that where our kid goes to college is is some kind of like judgment rendered on the job we did as uh, parents. I feel mostly like that's um, nonsense, um, although I totally understand how if you're coming from a situation where you didn't go to college, you couldn't go to college, um, uh, you know, maybe you're a, a, a recent or a relatively recent arrival to the country. You know, the fact that your kid's going to a name brand college is a badge of honor. I get it. And, you know, I grant you that honor. I'm proud of you. Uh, you should feel all of the, 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 the pride you, you deserve. Um, but I think the place where it gets even trickier is, um, the snobbery and elitism that, um, the gatekeepers in the marketplace for 22 year olds actually have themselves. So, you know, maybe it's in graduate school admissions or maybe, you know, it's on wall street or, uh, in the offices of Silicon Valley venture capitalists, um, uh, you know, or really at any institution that has historically hired disproportionately from the Ivy league or, um, other similar institutions. Right. Um, and so there you kind of have to ask yourself, right? Okay, like my 17-year-old daughter, she wants nothing more than to be an investment banker on Wall Street and like the bigger and better the bank, the better, right? So it's like if she's got a full ride at Penn State, um, and but she's also gotten into Penn, right? And there's going to be a $350,000 difference between those two things. And, and we can afford it, right? Maybe it won't be easy, right? Maybe we need a little debt. Maybe she needs a little debt, but 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 we can afford it. Um, I, I, I don't think there's any doubt that there are 50 to 100 times more people, you know, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, uh, you know, from Penn than from Penn State, particularly in the marquee jobs, right? Right. So, you know, for a small number of people, for a small number of jobs, that snobbery and elitism actually matters some. We don't know how yeah. much, maybe it's changing, right? But it matters. Um, and I don't, I don't want to discount that, right? So, I, you know, I don't know if your kid is paying for the party and that's what they care about the most and you don't have a problem with that or you yeah. want them just to graduate with the biggest possible network because they're going to work for your family business and you know, all of these people in, in the Greek, in, you know, the Greek scene at, you know, Penn State or University of Indiana are going to become their potential customers. Then why would you pay $400,000 for an Ivy League degree? That doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, so it, it really depends. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because I love, I love how you go through that. And I think because I've been doing this for so long, I go, the honors school at a public university, those honors programs are amazing. And they get so many perks and you could go to grad school. You know, it's like, go go to the honors program for a free ride, build a network at a place where you're among the leaders of this large institution with the plan that you'll go to grad school. And I don't know enough about finance to know if that's a path, but to then go to Wharton or wherever you're going to go for your, your uh, or I don't know if it would be Wharton for finance, but like, but going into that, being the best at that other place, so then going in there, to to that, and then and then having so still having that association, because I just have such a hard time if someone doesn't have the money. You know, I think that's kind of like the asterisk. If you're borrowing three hundred thousand dollars versus a school giving you, which was a question someone wrote to me, and 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 I give a thoughtful answer, but I always I start with the the school that's going to be the least expensive. And can you get there? And then there's the other part. If more people are coming from these highly selective schools, well, there's still 50% or 40% that are coming from other places. And who are those people? And what's the value of those people? Which, you know, connects. And I think that both of our answers really, I think, match really nicely uh, because you know, we need, they need to go through that. But I think you should 
so much you look at all of that and find what's right. But then there's the community college piece. And I heard you answer this question. I loved how you attack the community college piece because I'm also someone who says, listen, if you're in a state that has a great feeder system where there's a current relationship with the university, like in Chicago, in Illinois, from Illinois, there's Parkland, Parkland Community College. Parkland has a relationship with the University of Illinois. You go to Parkland as a community college student. You get access to University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. You get access to their campus. You get to take a couple classes in their buildings. You live in their residence halls. You can't. You 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 essentially are a Parkland student, and they do this at some of the UC schools. I know the, of another student who went to Cal, who went to the community college. Um, give us our give us your community college approach, so that families and students who want to pursue that path and have big dreams can stay on track. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, it's uh, it's a way to save, you know, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars. I saw a cost of attendance sheet a week or two ago for uh, the University of California at Santa Barbara. In-state students who have, you know, housing there and on campus is often cheaper than uh, off campus at some of the UC schools. Uh, you know, it's over forty thousand dollars for an in-state student. So. You know, if you can bear to live at home um, and go to community college for, you know, five grand or less, I mean, that just, you know, represents uh, $70,000 in savings if you're not qualifying for other um, need-based aid. So, you know, the money's a good reason to do it. Um, so here's the thing, right? Um, these, uh, you know, agreements um, and pipelines that the community colleges have with state universities um, are excellent, um, but they also require you to be absolutely 101.8% on top of your stuff, right? Which credits transfer, which credits don't, which credits transfer into which degree program, right? Who is your counselor at the community college? Who is your admissions counselor at the end institution? Are you in touch with the department head, you know, where it, it, where you want to be a major? And are you checking in with those people every six weeks, right? What are you doing to make sure that you are first in line um, for registration at community college to make sure you get those classes that you need so that this is all seamless? Way more often than not, this goes off the rails, right? But if you are um, truly determined to make it work, it absolutely can work. And there's some incredible counselors at the community colleges who are uh, totally dedicated to helping you fulfill that goal. Now, what will you give up when you get there? Well, you know, you'll only have two years or three years to make the kinds of connections that you otherwise might have, uh, you know, in four or five if you started at the at the you know at the end school. Uh, as a first year student. So, um, you know, there is some some sacrifice and some compromise, but, um, you know, 50 or 60 or $70,000 in savings is a lot, right? Um, and, you know, none of the snobs um, who are going to be psyched uh, that you went to Berkeley or UCLA or, you know, or you're a scientist coming out of UCSD um, or a winemaker coming out of Davis, right? Nobody's going to be... Uh, looking for or caring that, you know, you started at Santa Monica City or whatever. Um, you know, they're they're looking at the end degree. Yeah, I love that. And I wanted to give you the space to share it because I want to share that clip because I think it's such an important way of looking at going through that going through that process. You need to be accountable. You need to be intentional. You need to make sure you take advantage of your people and places. And it can be a really great path. When I see students who went to community college uh, completed their undergraduate degree and then went to a graduate program, I think th this person is unstoppable, right? Like this is someone who knows what they want. They're really smart at getting it. They're focused. They're able to manage because exactly what Ron was saying, in order to get that degree, if you want to get that degree in four years, and it could take you five years, whatever you want, you 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 can, maybe you need that space. Maybe you're working and you spread it out a little bit. It, it's fine, but it says so much. And employers, I think, are looking at that and instead of saying, oh, what this, there's a stigma, it's, oh, wow, this person knows the hack. I mean, do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely a way to look at it. I mean, I, you know, I, I agree with you. I, I, I have a colleague, one of our higher education reporters started in community college. And I just look at him and I'm like, this guy learned way more about how the world works between the ages of 18 and 22 than I did. There's just no... 
there's no comparison, right? And so, you know, if I was looking at his resume at all, let alone for a job covering higher education as a journalist, I'd just be slobbering all over it. I wish there were more people who saw the world that way. But, you know, if uh, people like you and me keep talking about it in front of other people, hopefully uh, other people will, will see it the same way. Right. It's like if you started a community college, you're probably a striver. You probably had to hustle. There's a decent chance you did not have it all handed to you. And the fact that you got to the other side and you're here in my inbox or my office or on the other side of the phone means that like you're a comer. Right. Um, yeah. And I want to I want to know you. I I, I want to I want to be your colleague. I want to do business with you because you, you know stuff that I don't know. Right. And that's that's what I want to model. And I'm really uh I've been really focused on interviewing students. I've been working with some community colleges in Illinois to really show that path and to then to show the alumni and to really help people to see how can you go through this. And, and there, even if there was something, because now with technology, I feel like the game has changed. Like the game has changed. There's no longer the gatekeepers of, of, of information. You know, a, anybody can get information now. And it's a matter of what information do you want and who are the people who are doing the things you want. That's where like, the finance piece. And I was like, I kind of grabbed onto that. I was at the airport last night before I did. A, I took a red eye and I was listening to, um, you did the one with the dads. It was like the dad, the dad uh, podcast. I really like that. That's, that's a really good one. We'll link to that. I like linking to lots of podcasts because when I have a guest, I really like to, I like, I like to learn more, but there's this part, Ron, where I think with technology and just boundless curiosity, and the ability to overcome rejection or use curiosity to overpower rejection. There are so many ways to align with people who, using the investment banking example, someone who went to the big investment bank, but then they open their own firm. And a student who has this boundless curiosity, who bypasses the big firm and goes to those who graduated and saw, I can do it better or I want to do it this way, and someone who absorbs that information and then reaches out to those people who are rule breakers or disruptors, and they're young and curious and interested. Like I think there's something to be said about that, and they can invest now. You can invest when you're 18. You can play these games, and you can share this, whereas 10, 15, 20 years ago, you couldn't do any of this. So like the powers to the, the power of the person with the passion and the drive, I don't, I don't know. I feel like there's something to be said about that too. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I couldn't agree more. Um, and so, um, you know, if, if there's risk that you're taking, it's that, um, you know, the person on the other side of whatever transaction uh, or transactions you're going to be engaged in, in the, you know, first five to 10 years of your career or graduate school education won't see that in in you um, the way that the the, the you and I uh, see it and are talking about it here. Um, you know, there are some some people out there who uh, would just uh, rather uh, hire people whose educational backgrounds look like their own. That's kind of what Absolutely. they're absolutely yeah. I think um, just options, you know, you know, that's kind of what what we're fighting against here. Yeah, and there's options, and I try to show different paths and. You know, I, I love I love your reporting, uh, your money columnist with the New York Times, Ron Lieber, author of The Price You Pay for College, a father going through this. Just a, I, you really are a kind person. I mean, I really feel like you want people to be successful, and um, you know, and I do too. And, and I hope in just like challenging or at least offering different perspectives during our conversation. You know, we don't know each other that well, but um, you know, it's like I love that. And uh, I want to do more of it, and I really want to help people. So uh, I encourage everyone to check out Ron's books, to check out your Merit Aid course. We'll link to that, to check out the latest pieces you've published. Is there anything else, Ron, that we can direct people to to help them, support them? No, you've ticked off all of the all of the best ones. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And, and if, if with your permission, if there's an opportunity to to have a conversation just on merit aid, you know, because I think that merit aid is really the the piece that people don't always understand. It's not need based. I feel like there's an a lot of people have needs, especially the students who fall into that range where 
they're they're in that donut hole where the parents make just enough to not have access. That merit aid is really crucial. So do you think you'd be open to to doing that sometime? Absolutely. So um, that's that sounds great. Uh, I think we covered everything today. Is there anything else you wanted to leave everyone with? I don't think so. Just um, recognize that, uh, you know, for all of the, the the craziness and discord and confusion and messiness right now, um, it, you are not alone, right? Um, so many other people are experiencing the same thing. Um, and hopefully this too shall pass. Yeah. That sounds great. Well, we'll be there to help, to be in your corner, and you can send me your messages. You can send Ron your messages if there's things you want to highlight in terms of just what you dealt with during this academic year, uh, dealing with all the FAFSA, the money issues, the deadlines, the non-refundable deposits, whatever that is, send it to us because you know maybe there's something there that we can highlight and share to, to hopefully make things a little bit better or at least for things to be a little more transparent because that's that's where I stand. I'm in the corner of parents and families. I know you stand there as well. So thanks, Ron. So grateful to have you today. Thank you.